Hi everybody, Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. Hope you're doing well. So as you may have heard, a magazine, and for my younger readers, a magazine is a way of taking text from the internet, running it through trees, and putting it into your hands so that the pinch zoom doesn't work. The magazine called National Review has an entire issue devoted against Trump, and it's got a bunch of conservative, um, I guess we could say thinkers, and uh, they have contributed, I guess you could say, articles against uh, Donald Trump. And this is very, very instructive. And um, it is a magazine which has an audience, of course, and an audience are your customers, and it's a magazine that's supposed to be devoted to free market principles. And generally, uh, I've run a bunch of businesses in my life, generally what you do is if you can't understand why your customers are interested in something other than what you have to offer, you go and ask them. It's not brain surgery. Like if, okay, for the conservatives out there who are against Trump, if you run a restaurant and a new restaurant opens up across the street and people all swarm to that restaurant and they don't come to your restaurant anymore, taking out a bunch of ads saying, well, the new restaurant sucks, actually is just kind of insulting your customers and is going to drive even more of them away. What you could do, you know, it's possible, what you could do if you had half a brain in your ideological semi-craniums -cran is you could go across the street, sit in the restaurant and ask the people, hey, why do you like this restaurant so much? You know, it's not that hard. In the Trump rallies, you see people kind of all aggregate together. You don't have to hunt them down, right? They're not like rare dictics in Manitoba. You don't have to hunt them down. You, they all gather and they're actually quite happy to talk to people. So. It's just quite remarkable to me that these people who claim to be interested in the free market and claim to care about their customers are insulting the new restaurant which everyone wants to go and eat at rather than just asking people, what do you like about the new restaurant? Maybe we can do some of that. And it's not that hard. What people like about the new restaurant is, in general, immigration policies. And it's not that hard to figure out why. See, let me lay it out for you. White people generally like smaller government. White people from the European tradition of limited government and freedom and free market and human rights and rights for women and so on, generally like smaller government. Non-European cultures generally like larger government, which is why Muslims and Hispanics overwhelmingly vote for larger government. Only about 11% of Muslims are in the Republican camp. The rest of them are all, of course, generally voting Democrats if they're affiliated with anyone at all. So if you want smaller government, then you can't have too many Hispanics and Muslims in your country. Because in a couple of years, the amount of uh, Muslim and Hispanic immigration, I guess you could say, swarming, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to cancel out the entire Tea Party. Now, the people who've devoted decades of their lives to trying to get smaller government. Now, culture matters. Race, ethnicity matters in terms of voting patterns. And people don't really listen to reason. So the idea that you can bring a bunch of incompatible cultures in and just reason them into your culture doesn't work. And we've got a whole presentation on this channel called The Death of Reason, which is very well sourced, which points that out. So people who want smaller government have been working for the Tea Party, been working for the Republicans, and it hasn't worked. Government's gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. And despite the fact that the Republicans control significant portions of the government, it's not slowing down. In fact, it's accelerating. So they're looking for another alternative for smaller government other than the Republican Party, which has failed completely and totally and utterly in reining in the expansion and growth of state power. Now, Donald Trump is talking about immigration. That is a key issue. It's really not that complicated. All you have to do is go and ask people and they'll tell you quite simply and quite clearly. People who want small government want to keep big government cultures out because they can't change their minds by reasoning. And that's the entirety and beginning and end, the, the alpha and the omega of the Trumpness. Uh, and of course, there's other issues as well. But that's the one that Donald Trump, the master of media, decided to open up his presidential campaign with. And that's what's happening. People who want smaller government are happy to take immigrants from smaller government cultures uh, anywhere in Europe and so on. But uh, in general, that's what's happening. It's not really that, competent, uh, that complicated. This food is tasty. Your food tastes like us. And that's really all that's happening. So I just really want to point out that when all of these Republican Blanche Dubois clutch at their pearls and faint on their couch and demand their semi-Victorian smelling salts because they just can't fathom why anybody's interested in Donald Trump. They're interested in Donald Trump, my friends, because you are a bunch of betraying, backstabbing crap weasels who tend to collude with the Democrats to screw over 
the remnants of the middle class in this country. Donald Trump is not a candidate. He is a murder weapon against the existing Republican establishment who's repeatedly, be, repeatedly betrayed the small government wannabes in the country. And he is also the murder weapon against the media who constantly threatens everyone with racism for talking about incompatible cultures. Because you see, the media is so into diversity that they constantly put out ads saying, you know, we don't have enough Republicans here. We really need to hire some more Republicans. No, they don't. They don't care about diversity. Diversity is just a way of saying, let's get a bigger government. And if we have to import big government cultures to do so, fantastic, because we're in gated communities and we're fine. So with that in mind, we're going to return to Tom Sowell, Dr. Thomas Sowell, who um, I had, have, had, have, had, have some uh, significant respect for in the past. I've talked about him very positively in this show. But I'm afraid he has fallen into the crap weasel pit of sophistry. And uh, here we go with his contribution to the National Review. In a country with more than 300 million people, it is remarkable how obsessed the media has become with just one, Donald Trump. What is even more remarkable is that after seven years of repeated disasters, both domestically and internationally, under a glib egomaniac in the White House, so many potential voters are turning to another glib egomaniac to be his successor. It's not remarkable, Dr. Sowell. You just have to ask people. He goes on to write, No doubt, much of the stampede of Republican voters towards Mr. Trump is based on the disgust with the Republican establishment. It's easy to understand why there would be pent-up resentments among Republican voters. But are elections held for the purpose of venting emotions? Right. So this is a massive insult to the uh, Republicans or the Democrats, 20% of whom want to vote for Trump as well, who are interested in smaller government, in enforcing the laws, and in securing a culture that took, I don't know, 2,500 years to develop small government thoughts in. So the idea, and this, you hear this all, all, all the time, you know, white, white males are, are angry, and, and they feel the control of the country slipping away, and they're lashing out, and they're lashing back. It's all emotions, it's emotions, it's emotions. Well... There are very good demographic, statistical, cultural, political, philosophical, and other reasons for the support for, doctor, uh, for, for Donald Trump, right? I was going to say Ben Carson. Uh, there was some support for Ben Carson. Seems to have fallen just a little bit. But um, So this idea that if you studiously refuse to examine the arguments of your opponents, then you can just describe them as... Well, just running on emotion for no reason whatsoever. It's like, but, but you are the one who have studiously chosen to refuse to examine the motives, the arguments, the, the, um, the motivations behind people's support for Donald Trump. Uh, it is not just a mad stampede that's incomprehensible to you. It's only incomprehensible to you because you have studiously decided to stay away from understanding the position. That reveals your lack of intellectual curiosity, your hypocrisy, and you wading into an arena that you are wildly incompetent in because you're not even asking people why they're interested, right? They're not hard to find, and Donald Trump has a whole bunch of um, uh, videos. He's doing interviews all the time. Agree or disagree, at least understand the position of the people that you're calling idiots. Because if you just say, well, they're just emotional idiots, and you've never actually asked them why they support what they support, you're the emotional idiot. Sorry, there is one in the room. It's just not who you're pointing at. Here He goes on to say... Um, uh, Tom Sowell, no national leader ever aroused more fervent emotions than Adolf Hitler did in the 1930s. Oh, man. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Dr. Sowell. Oh, oh, no. We're on the Soul train to nowhere. So he's bringing up the Hitler because... You know, Adolf Hitler, a murderous dictator who started a war that cost 40 million lives, Donald Trump builds hotels. You know what Adolf Hitler didn't do was leave a lot of complimentary chocolates on people's pillows. <laughs> and so now, of course, this is, you know where this argument is, and it's all over the place. And it's so retarded, I can't even tell you. Actually, I'm going to tell you. The argument is Donald Trump is popular. Adolf Hitler was popular. Therefore, Donald Trump is Adolf Hitler. Everyone who is popular is Adolf Hitler. You see, Justin Bieber, very popular, Adolf Hitler. Ronald Reagan, very popular, Adolf 
Hitler. Churchill during the war, enormously popular, therefore Adolf Hitler. Everyone who's popular is Hitler. Well, I guess Dr. Soule and others in National Review are certainly dealing with their Hitlerishness by <laughs> shooting their own popularity in the foot. And so what do you even say? I mean, the, 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 how can you possibly, re popularity is not an ethical standard. Popularity is not an ethical standard at all. Good people are popular among good people and they're unpopular among bad people. Bad people are popular among bad people and unpopular among good people. Socrates, quite popular among philosophers in ancient Athens 2,500 years ago. Therefore, Socrates is Hitler! Yeah, that works. <laughs> Apparently, the Socratic method is invade Poland and then kill all your soldiers off in Russia in the winter. <laughs> That's the Socratic method. See reason! Anyway, so he goes on to say, Watch some old newsreels of German crowds delirious with joy at the sight of him. The only things at all comparable in more recent times were the ecstatic crowds that greeted Barack Obama when he burst upon the political scene in 2008. See, here's a basic question, <laughs> and it's so basic I'm embarrassed to even point it out. Oh, what propaganda does to formerly functioning brains. So, um, the question is, are they the same people? You see, <laughs> Germans were very happy to see Hitler for a variety of reasons. Perhaps we'll do a show on one day. German crowds, a lot of them are very happy to see Hitler, even though Hitler actually never gained a majority in Germany and only about, uh, I don't know, 10 or 12 percent of, of German adults were uh, registered members of the Nazi party, but neither here nor there. See, lots of crowds cheered Hitler and lots of crowds cheered Churchill. Therefore, English people were all Nazis. I mean, <laughs> How can you even, how can you even say that? How can you even say that? Oh. You know, this crowd is cheering Team A, at the same crowd is cheering Team B, therefore they're exactly the same. <laughs> so they're not the same. A lot of people were very happy about Barack Obama, and, and mostly it's because, hey, remember how Barack Obama was going to break the spell and the curse of being called racist in America if he got the election? Remember how that all vanished and nobody's ever called racist anymore? See, ending racism with Barack Obama, just another government program. Mmm, feel the burn. So, they're not the same crowds. Uh, you know, the Barack Obama people were leftists, mostly hanging off the tee to the state and sucking dry the next generation in order to break up and sell their body parts to Chinese banksters in the future. The people going for uh, Donald Trump tend to be uh, Republicans who want smaller government. See, crowds who want bigger government, cheering Barack Obama. Crowds who want smaller government, cheering Donald Trump. Not the same people have opposite aims and one will win at the expense of the other because if the people on the left get bigger government, that hurts the people on the right who are generally paying taxes. And if people on the right get smaller government, that will at least in the short run hurt people on the left. See, it's a win-lose situation, so you can't call them the same people. <sighs> well, you can, but it's tragic. <laughs> he goes on to say, Elections, however, have far more lasting and far more serious or even grim consequences than emotional venting. The actual track record of crowd pleasers, whether Juan Perón in Argentina, Obama in America, or Hitler in Germany, is very sobering, if not painfully depressing. Okay, so anyone who's popular with any group is automatically like Perón in Argentina, semi-dictator Obama in America, semi-autocrat and Hitler in Germany, outright fascist dictator or socialist dictator. National. The reason you hear the word Nazism rather than the, you call the Communist Party the Communist Party, the reason the word Nazism had to be invoked was because the media is on the left and the historians are generally left-leaning. I know, took a grad degree in history. Oh, so far left, nobody, everyone cut off their right hand. And uh, so they don't want the word Nazi to be spelled out, right? It was the National German Workers Socialist Party. It was a socialist party that Hitler was in charge in, uh, of, and so um, they don't want you to know that, so they create this term Nazi so they can stick it on the right, which is a little bit tricky if the actual party is a socialist party. Tough to stick them on the right, so. Um, uh, Nazism versus communism was uh, semi-communism versus outright communism. It was just uh, the two same left-wing mafia gangs at war. Anyway. So um, anyone who, cre who pleases the crowd uh, is, is 
is a deadly dictator. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got it. That Freddie Mercury fascist bastard. Did you hear that Radio Gaga? Might as well have been a Nazi salute. All right. So he goes on to say, after the disastrous nuclear deal with Iran, we are entering an era where people alive at this moment may live to see a day when American cities are left in radioactive ruins. We need all the wisdom, courage, and dedication in the next president and his or her successors to save us and our children from such a catastrophe. A shoot from the hip, bombastic show off is the last thing we need or can afford. Right, so a vote for Donald Trump is a vote to turn America into a nuclear wasteland. <laughs> God, I mean, do people even listen to themselves? I mean, do they, do they actually listen to what they're saying? Or are they just so full of irrational hatred that they don't understand how ridiculous they look to anybody who's got a semi-thinking brain? So if you vote for Donald Trump, you are voting for America to be bombed in a nuclear fashion. It's exactly what Condi Rice said. We don't want the smoking gun to be in the form of a mushroom cloud, so we've got to go and bomb Saddam Hussein to make everyone safe. <laughs> now, bye-bye uh, Europe, uh, bye-bye um, the personal space of European women, and uh, hello, Stumpy! <laughs> so, uh, it's just, uh, it's I mean, it's ridiculous. And, and what is, you know, Dr. Thomas Sowell, uh, has, like most intellectuals, pushed back against ad hominem arguments, which is insulting the person rather than the position. Shoot from the hip, bombastic show off. Yeah, excellent, rigorous intellectual analysis. I'm so glad you got that doctorate. So, um, the last thing we need or can afford, it's the, I think, Donald Trump is literally the last person in America who should be president. He's the last thing we need, the last thing we need. A homeless guy should be president before Donald Trump. A guy in a coma should be president before Donald Trump. And also, Dr. Sol, how on earth can people, like, how can you, how can you bring up the Iran deal, which Donald Trump has vociferously opposed, and say that's why we shouldn't have Donald Trump in? I oppose the Iran deal. Well, we can't have you in power because the Iran deal was really bad. Oh, what do you even say? What do you even say? Well, I guess I've said it. It's Ivan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. If you like these analyses, freedomainradio.com slash donate. Unlike Dr. Soul, I'm not in the uh, cozy amniotic state protected sack of academia. I actually have to go and uh, work for a living and rely on customers. So freedomainradio.com slash donate. See, Dr. Soul, remember, has a big problem with eminent domain that Donald Trump ended up not even using because Donald Trump, because uh, Tom Soul's, a lot of his Salary uh, comes from state protection and state power. But if Donald Trump tries it even once, well, he's just such a bad guy. Stephen Mullen, you out. Thanks so much for watching.